Yeah. We are starting a series today on uh, women in the Bible, and I hope you stay with that because there's just a lot of great stuff there that we're going to go through. Um, I did get sent to me recently uh, a script that, you know, it's one of those things where kids make mistakes talking about the Bible kind of stuff. And this one says that uh, it's actually entitled How Asparagus Got Its Name. And I'm only going to read the part about Adam and Eve, so it goes on for pages. And it says that it was written by a sixth grader. I absolutely do not believe that. I really don't, to be honest with you. And I'm not the skeptic type, but it's like there's stuff in here that no sixth grader came up with that. So, um, but anyhow, it's about the, the child's Bible in a nutshell. It goes, begins like this. In the beginning, which occurred near the start, there was nothing but God, darkness, and some gas. The Bible says, the Lord thy God is one, but I think he must be a lot older than that. Anyway, God said, give me a light, and someone did. Then God made the world. He split the Adam and made Eve. At, yeah, that, thank you for at least thinking with me here. I like this line. Adam and Eve were naked, but they weren't embarrassed because mirrors hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating one bad apple, so they were driven from the Garden of Eden. Not sure what they were driven in, though, because they didn't have cars. So anyhow, I apologize for, for all that, but I did think it's interesting. I really did love the song, and I wish you could have seen the words to the song because there's just so much there that when you think about uh, and it and it wasn't in the song but I read it somewhere else like you know how did Adam go from first person singular to first person plurals like how do you start talking about we what is a we you know you there's two of us how did that happen uh, his life really got complicated didn't it <clears throat> Adam called his wife's name Eve that's what Genesis chapter 3 tells us in verse 20. The name Eve actually means life or giver of life. And, uh, and obviously we all know that Eve is the mother of all the living. Scripture tells us that as well. <clears throat> that concludes several things. We know this to be true. God is the creator. We know that. We're not going to spend, we could spend the next year and a half talking about creation we're not going to do that. You have to assume a couple things here. Eve was especially designed and built by God. She was probably the pinnacle of everything that God made up to that time, an amazing creation. She's the only living being ever directly created by God from living tissue. God made Adam from a handful of dirt. God made Eve from a handful of Adam. There's four times when her name's mentioned in the Bible. I've already given you uh, those things uh, in your outline, those passages. But uh, here's some things that we don't know about Eve. Uh, we don't know how many children that she and Adam had. We have the name of three sons, and there may have been more. We just have three of them named. And there were multiple daughters, which is how everybody got going at that time, no sin uh, initially, so uh, or very little sin, and, and so less of the mutants and things like that. We don't know how long she lived. We don't know that. We know Adam lived till he was 930, but we don't know how long she lived, and we don't know where or how she died. Uh, we just know that she probably did because we haven't met her lately. And... Um, in Genesis 5, it tells us a little bit about Adam and toward the end of his life. But we do know, and this is what we're going to talk about today, we do know how she came into existence. We have a lot of detail on that. We know all about her temptation and fall into sin. And we know that there was a hope that she held on to throughout the rest of her life. So I'm going to read to you from Genesis chapter 2 verse 20 to 25, and I may break into wedding mode in the middle of this, and I apologize, um, but that's just what I'm used to with this passage. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. 
So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. It started off telling about all the different animals that God created. And if you go back a couple verses, you'll see that Adam was given the responsibility of giving names to all those different animals. <clears throat> There's a lot of fun things we can say about that. But in their culture, when someone gave a name to something else, that indicated the mastership or the lordship over that. Adam was given dominion over the earth, so he was the master of the, of the world and was assigned that uh, task of giving names. And it tells us God performs a surgical procedure here and anesthetizes um, Adam. That word there that says he went into a deep sleep is found seven times in the Old Testament. And every time that I can determine that it's used, it's talking almost all the other ones are about deep sleeps where God uh, gives a vision to them that uh, they're so out that he wants them to grasp this un uninhibited message. Adam and Eve also were both made without sin. Some have questioned whether, because there was no sin, whether Adam perhaps did not feel any pain. I, I'm not so sure. I'm not ready to equate that all pain is necessarily sin. So I, I don't know on that one. But we do know this. The fact that he was unconscious, anesthetized, he was unable to contribute anything to this project. He didn't have any rights to say to God, well, could you just maybe make the hair a little longer or, or whatever he wanted to add. And remember, um, when God created things at the end of uh, chapter 1, that he pronounced everything was very good. And when he made a uh, woman and man, that certainly was true. Everything was very, very good. The work was whole. It was complete. And all of it was done by God. Again, since Adam had not sinned at this point, it's possible, well, I would say it's true, there was no chance of infection coming in. Um, some wonder if he had post-op discomfort. I'm going to say no because I rarely do, so he probably doesn't. How about a scar? Could he have a scar? Is that sinful? I don't know. I don't, I don't know that he had to have a scar or that he had to lose one. Adam lost a rib, but he gained a soulmate. When he saw her, he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, for she was taken from Ish, which are the Hebrews' words for man and woman, uh, which I think really connects really well. Several years ago, I was with um, some African-American uh, pastors. I think that's what you call them. They were from Cleveland. And we spent some time together, and one of them was telling me that this gentleman was in his 70s at the time, and he was telling me that previous Sunday he had just preached on this text, and he told me that he kind of got a little bit out of control, which that scares me alone, you know, with a black preacher saying that he got out of control. What would he think is out of control? But he said, here's what he did, okay? He said when, when Adam looked up and saw Eve, he went something like this, mm, <clears throat> bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I have no idea what that was like. I think he did get a little out of control. The Hebrew word, therefore, um, that God made Eve <clears throat> denotes careful, intelligent construction design. The word made means to build. Literally, she was built by God. And she was suited for Adam. Now, I've seen different attributes. And I think you go back to the farthest one. So that would be Martin Luther. But I also see Matthew Henry, uh, the great theologian, given this phrase. And I've told couples all the time, every time we go through this passage, that I'm not so convinced this is what God was thinking. But here's what a Martin Luther said. 
He said that God took the rib. He didn't take part of the skull because he didn't want her to be over Adam. And he didn't take, Martin Luther said the toe, Matthew Henry said the foot. He didn't take a bone from the toe or the foot because he didn't want her to be tread on by Adam. But he took a rib next to the heart because she was to be loved and protected. I agree with the sentiment. I just don't know if that's what God was thinking when he did that. She was to be the answer for his need for companionships. She was to be the source of joy. She was to be his future uh, for procreation. Eve was Adam's equal in every way. She was a spiritual counterpart, an intellectual co-equal. Just like him, she was intelligent, she had personality, she had ethics, she had morals, she was spiritual. She was a perfect mate. They shared unity together. They were one flesh. Not just a physical union thing, but so much more. It was a monogamous relationship that God wants and expects. It was a heterosexual, not Adam and Steve, it was Adam and Eve. It was to be a permanent relationship that they were going to be together all the time, united throughout life. And there were distinctions. And believe it or not, eventually, all psychiatrists and psychologists will come to that understanding. But there is a difference between guys and girls, men and women. Lots of distinctions. Some of them um, may be sociological. Some of them may be emotional. Some of them are psychological, but there are differences. And God gave them divinely designed roles, each of them. Adam was to be the provider, the protector, the father, the leader. Eve was to be the comforter, the nurturer, the mother, the helper. They worked together. She complimented him. He complimented her. She was subordinate to him, but she was subordinate to him in the same exact way that Jesus is subordinate to his father. So then we move into the temptation and the fall in chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. might be familiar to you. Now the serpent... There's no introduction. All of a sudden, he's there. The serpent, you know to be Satan, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of, of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When a woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. We don't have a time frame here as to how much time passed between the, the creation of Adam, the making of Eve, and, and this all happening. I really believe it was a matter of hours. Uh, I think, and, and absolutely know this is true, that she was not pregnant yet, so probably it really was pretty quick on the scene. We had no introduction to Satan, but all of a sudden here he is. We didn't know anything about him, didn't know anything about snakes. If, um, if this is really early on, and of course it had to have been, if it's really early on, it's a perfect situation for Satan because he could tempt them and, and take care of their uh, their living in paradise, he could infect the entire human race with one swift failure of Eve if he got them early on. Now, we know this is Satan. We know what he's done. He, 
Some believe he apparently singled her out. I know it says that at some point here, Adam was with, with her, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he had to have been there when she had failed. Uh, he, he might have come on a little bit later, which I think makes more sense. He could have apparently singled her out. I think it was so early on that um, Eve was not aware that snakes don't talk or that they don't walk around uh, in the form that they did. So as he possessed the snake and spoke to, to her, he put some skepticism uh, in between her and God. He said, has God really, did he indeed say this? And you saw what he questioned. So we go back to chapter 2 and we read, What did God really say to Adam? You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. You'll surely die. So Satan puts up this question. He's questioning the word of God. He's questioning how certain the meaning of all this is. He's putting doubt about the truthfulness of this. He's raising suspicious ulterior motives that perhaps God had. Is that really what he said? And you probably noticed that she, um, I think inadvertently, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm taking the view that Eve was taken unaware, taken by shock. She was innocent, naive. Um, and she added the phrase, you must not touch it. Now, we don't know what Adam told Eve. We know what God told Adam, but Adam had to tell Eve about this um, prohibition. So we don't know if he added that or not, or if Eve just threw it in there. But I think in her nervous moments, we've all been there, that you know maybe you don't get everything exactly right, but that's what she did. Uh, you shall not eat of this. And it's interesting how Satan brings up the fact that his, his, um, his lead statements, his primary emphasis is that God said you can't do this. When the statement that God made was you could do any of this in the entire garden that you want to, except for this one thing. And Satan makes it look like God was um, really stingy. It takes away God's generous offer to them and makes him look real stingy. The scriptures are clear that Eve failed first. But Adam still held responsible for that. It's Adam who heard the command. It was Adam who shared it with Eve. And he was directly responsible to protect and to instruct her. The scriptures said that God told them that if you eat this, you're going to die. And Satan's saying, no, you won't. You won't die. In fact, God knows that you're going to be equal to him. How did they die that day? I mean, was God right or was he wrong? Well, he was right because remember the basic concept of to die or death is a separation. It's just when somebody dies physically, they're separated. Their body and their spirit are separated. Their spirit goes on to stand before Christ and, and be uh, deemed out where they're to be. When we die spiritually, we're separated between us and God. And that's what happened that day. They died spiritually when this happened. They were no longer in that intimate fellowship with God, but then uh, they will later on die physically. I think Eve was really confused, really flustered. And the snake said to her, your eyes will be opened. And I looked at some of the other uses of that phrase in, in the Old Testament, and every time it's talking about a blind person who was able to see. It's as if someone who was totally blind could now see. That's going to happen for you, Eve. Think about that offer. Think about that offer. You're just new to this thing. You've only existed for hours. And now somebody's saying to you, no, 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 you misunderstood. You don't, God didn't tell you exactly right. If you do this, if you eat this fruit, Anne always says it's chocolate covered, makes it more tempting. If you, if you eat this fruit, then you're going to be able to see things that you've never seen before. You're going to know things that you didn't know. You're going to wonder and experience amazing things, and you're going to be just like God. I would have been standing there saying, 
wow, just like God? I could be like him? Wow, that's amazing. Knowing and experiencing things. Here's what's really true. Eating the fruit did not make her like God. It made her like Satan. Fallen, corrupt, condemned. Eve was deceived, but Adam willingly sinned. Full of knowledge. His eyes were wide open. Scripture says in 1 Timothy 2 that Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgressions. There is a very foundational doctrine of Christianity that absolutely must be known and understood by everybody. It's called the doctrine of original sin. The doctrine of original sin. We believe that Eve and Adam both sinned, and because of that, they were separated from God, and they have transmitted to every single human being since then the sinful nature. We are conceived in sin. And we could go on and on for weeks about this, and we're not going to do that. Just accept that much. That kind of goes against what a lot of the psychologists and sociologists say, who will say, well, man is basically good. It's just sometimes things influence them in a bad way and bad things happen to them. We believe what God told Jeremiah, the prophet, that man is desperately wicked. His heart is desperately wicked. Who can even understand heart? You don't understand your heart. You've had evil and wicked thoughts at times, and you don't understand even where that comes from. You don't know why you feel that way, why it's so irritating to you. Um, that's just the sinful nature of man. That's the way we are. Uh, some believe that we're the, like Descartes had the carta blanca, that we're just a blank sheet in whatever uh, environment influences us. The scriptures are very clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're made in sin. When Adam sinned, he did that as your representative head. He, died, he sinned for himself, he sinned for his wife, and they sinned for all of their offsprings. We were born sinful. I gave you some passages in your outline, and you need to look at those, but there's so much more. You could read about that as well. One sin brought sin on all of us. Their failure doomed all of us. But the good news is that one sacrifice, one perfect, unblemished, pure, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God sacrifice has brought salvation for all of us. Did you catch in verse 7 that they were really full of guilt? Uh, so much so that they knitted together those fig leaves and they hide themselves from God. The next bunch of verses are going to tell us about the curse. I'm going to read verses 8 through 19. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock. By the way, that word cursed there, that's the only place this is used in the Old Testament. That word, that Hebrew word for cursed, only Satan gets this one. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust, snakes. All the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you. This is to Satan. Uh, enmity between you and the woman. Between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head. You will strike his heel. To the woman he said. I will greatly increase your pains in childbirth. With pain you will give birth to children. And your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. To Adam he said. Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. 
Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return. So Satan got the curse. Adam and Eve got just some really harsh new realities to live by. They hid from God. They were discovered. That intimate fellowship now was broken down. Adam did what every good guy would do. He blamed his wife. But he also blamed God. He didn't just say, the woman made me do it. He said, the woman that you gave me. You're in this blame too thing, God. The woman, of course, blamed the serpent. He tempted me. Let's remember what James told us when it comes to our own temptations. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one's tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. All those things, the lust of the eyes, all of that was there. God didn't make any argument about this at all. He didn't argue with them about who's to blame or any of that stuff. There was no discussion. He simply announced what the punishment was going to be. I hope you see God's mercy in this. How? How is God merciful in this? Couldn't God have just wiped them out immediately? Couldn't he just, you know, destroyed them and said, this project, this experiment's over. Who needs humanity? I don't need that. Or could he have said, I'll start all over again. I'll have another Adam and Eve or something. But he didn't do that. He made significant changes to the environment, and that affected their lives greatly. Paradise lost. Life changed dramatically. Much, much more difficult. So the serpent, and we don't know a whole lot about what he looked like before that. We know what snakes look like. But he was now to crawl on the ground. His form, his movements, all that's altered. By the way, all the animals were cursed. All of them have to deal with the curse of the world. But Satan was reminded of his pending doom. He bruised his heel. That means when Christ was on the cross, you know, God took a bruise on the heel. But when Christ walked out of the grave and, and was victorious... It smashed that serpent's head. Satan was humbled and defeated by this. Adam was told, you're going to have to work much more harder. It's going to be more difficult. Why? Because now you're living in a dying, decaying world. And yours is going to end with physical death as well. Now Eve received some punishment as well. And that also affects Adam also. Pain in the childbirth. Conflict with her man, sadness, pain, loss, physical difficulties. That's now going to be your daily routine. And there's going to be struggle with your relationship with your husband. You're going to struggle over power and mastery. It, it literally means to attempt to usurp control. The two most important relationships for Eve was her husband and her children, and those were greatly impacted. What a horrible lot to fall upon. Isn't there any hope here? Is there any promise, anything good? Yes. And I think Eve, although that was frightening to her to hear all this stuff, had to feel like, but there's mercy. There's goodness here. There's a promise. There's hope. The fact that in cursing the, the Satan and the snake, that God mentioned her seed. That meant she's going to survive this judgment and is going to go on and have children. God's plan of a, of a creation of a world and of people is still on target. That's victory for her. She's not being removed from that position of the mother of all living. Theologians say that Genesis 3.15 is the first gospel when I'll put enmity between you two, but he will crush your head, you will strike his heel. 
That was a statement projecting to the cross of Jesus Christ and projecting to the uh, resurrection that Christ was going to give. It was a guarantee that her race was going to survive and that they can someday be saved because of the Messiah. Now, they were driven out of the garden. Yeah, that happened. And the flaming sword and all that was there that um, now was going to uh, keep them from coming back. They were prohibited to eat from that tree again, and, were, and it was guarded this time. And that was even an act of mercy of God. And she went on and gave birth to children. Chapter 4, verse 1, Adam lay with his wife, Eve. Probably not the first time, but she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. A little bit later, Abel. And then even toward the end of this chapter, uh, in verse 25, we see that Adam laid with her again, and she gave birth to a son named Seth. And it goes on to tell in chapter 5 that they had other children, and that Adam lived to be 930 years old. 930 years old. I'd say that's getting up there. We don't know about Eve. Through them, sin came into the world. But God also provided the Redeemer, the Savior, Jesus. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace and the mercy that we have in, in Christ Jesus. And Lord, as we, uh, as we close this time together and we think about uh, what you have done and all that you've given to us, what a horrible story the, the nature of sin is and what it has done to us as a race and as each one of us as individuals. We have felt that painful um, sting of death and the painful sting of sin very powerfully in our own lives. But we can also feel the hope and the peace, the grace, and the mercy of salvation in our Savior, Jesus. God, thank you so much for your provision of a way of eternal life through a Savior, Jesus. My prayer today is that each one here would know Christ as Savior and would have that assurance and that peace that can only come through him. And may you be honored and glorified. In Christ we pray. Amen.